Welcome to the 58th episode of the interview series. The interview series is a production of One Week Critique, an Iowa-based arts and education nonprofit that offers educational resources and editorial support to students and teachers of the literary arts. You can learn more about us and our programs or support our work by visiting our website, oneweekcritique.com. That's the number one week critique.com. Please like and subscribe to help us continue producing excellent content. I'm John Riccio, joined today by Dr. M. Soledad Caballero, whose poem, Someday I Will Visit Hawk Mountain, was the subject of a past teaching takeaway, a one week critique series exploring how a poem is put together line by line. Solidad is a Macondo and Canto Mundo Fellow, winner of the 2019 Cutthroat A Journal of the Arts Joy Harjo Poetry Prize and the 2020 Swim, Swim for the Fun of It contest. Her collection, I Was a Bell, 2021, won the 2019 Benjamin Saltman Poetry Prize and was published by Red Hen Press. I Was a Bell was named a 2022 Book of the Year by the International Association of Autoethnography and Narrative Inquiry, was awarded the 2022 Benjamin Franklin Silver Award by the Independent Book Publishers Association and was awarded the 2022 Juan Felipe Herrera Award for the best book of poetry by a single author in English by the International Latino Book Awards. Soledad is a professor of English and chair of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program at Allegheny College. Her scholarly work focuses on British Romanticism, travel writing, post-colonial literatures, women's gender and sexuality studies, and interdisciplinarity. She splits her time between Pittsburgh and Meadville, Pennsylvania. You can learn more about Soledad on her website, www.msoledadcaballero.com. Welcome, Soledad. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank you for being such a fan of my work and a supporter of my work. And also just you as a as a giver to the poetry community, John. It is an incredible amount of labor and love and generosity. And um, I also want to thank, thank One Week Critique for, for taking an interest in my work. I'm thrilled to be here. I can't believe it's been nine years since we were at Breadloaf. <laughs> I know, up on the mountain. <laughs> yes, yes. So I am thrilled. I'm thrilled to talk about the book and new projects and just kind of have a wonderful conversation about poetry. I'm looking forward to it on St. Patrick's Day of all days too. So I know, <laughs> yes, exciting. Great. I was a bell is my trip down fall 2021 literature lane as I was coming and going between my apartments and the University of Southern Mississippi's campus, annotating your book between office hours and research. Per Richard Blanco, I was a bell, negotiates the transitions of language, memory, country, her battle with cancer, counterbalancing the violence from which she fled with a transformative devotion to details. Whether it's the suit your father wears in the poem, Immigration Office, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 1985, white shirt, knit tie, the smell of dry cleaning still stuck inside the blue peeling wool, or cousin contrasts in the poem, forerunner, Jesus is easy. Witnesses wrote every word, followed commands, left families, fish for him. 
Lazarus alone gave him full credentials. John lived a salt's life separate from the glow. Is he waiting on something more? Your details are poetry's tintinabulation. What do you most cherish about the creative energies that brought this collection together? Thank you. You know, you're such a careful, generous reader of my work, John. I really appreciate that so much. Um, the creative energies, I think, started for me with giving myself permission to return to poetry. Um, you know, getting a PhD, uh, doing academic writing, I love doing. Um, but for a very long time, it existed as a divide of writing between that sort of writing and writing poetry. And I think there just felt to be a moment around 2014 when I had the opportunity to um, attend the Chautauqua Writers Festival and then I went to Breadloaf and it felt like maybe I was ready for a revision of my writing as a whole. And so the energy that sort of brought me back to poetry is in a way the energy that has always animated me, which is a love of language, a love of writing, a love of words. Um, and I think there was just permission, you know, sometimes the academic world has very strict boundaries between what one is supposed to write and can write and should write. Um, and I think I needed to have the freedom to imagine new writing or a return to writing that had always animated me. Um, and what I cherish about it is that um, it happened to my mind. The story I tell myself now is it happened organically. Um, who knows if that's right when one of the wonderful things in my career is I've had the opportunity to work with um, a scientist whose work is on memory um, and how memory works. And so um, she's taught me and I've learned also in the process of writing that every time we have a memory and remember it, it's a new memory, like it actually has been reanimated. And so it is new, even as we are putting it sort of together. So my memory of this now is this very beautiful, like, oh, I just sort of had the space and the time, but we all know that that had to have been pulsing even in an unconscious way for a while. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how it, it sort of came about. And it happened, I think the line came to me, you know, um, she speaks a gringa Spanish. I think that's sort of the line that, um, that started me on this journey as a whole. Nice. Now yeah. it's interesting you talk about academic writing and I'm just having a flashback now to all the papers <laughs> I wrote. It seems like half of the papers that I was working on during my PhD, they were trying to create some kind of new poetry movement. Either I wrote a paper on Sonia Sanchez and it was the polyrical, political plus lyrical. <laughs> Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. for my dissertation, it was the confurial, confessional surrealism. <laughs> I think my academic, the little ace I always bring is, let me just see what I can portmanteau and see if it gets me, but I, where can we go with this portmanteau? <laughs> yes. But you know, that divide is really, is, it feels very artificial. I know of its histories. I know why it might exist and, 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 but I find it now, um, utterly, utterly limiting. Mm -hmm. um, and so I hope that that doesn't, you know, what, when I think about how you read poetry, John, and the level of care and analysis and attention, a poet does that. Mm -hmm. That's the work oh, of a poet. Thanks. Right? Yeah. You know, maybe it's my way of atoning for once writing a paper on Joseph, Joe Brainerd's I Remember, I, and this was around 2017, so a certain Netflix series was very popular at the time. So I had the audacity, I think, I titled it Stranger Flings. I mean, because that's what goes <laughs> on, that's what goes on, I remember. You know, all due respect to Winona, and I think it was, you know, uh, one of the, Sean Astin or Mackenzie, one of the yeah. Astin brothers, you know, who'd been in The Hobbit. <laughs> now we get The Hobbits, but let's talk about poetry. Yes. Because Hobbits, ho Hobbits need poems too. <laughs> History 
and political horror are bedmates in the spell. Its narrative window, 7,000 miles between Santiago and the Midwest, writing about a past that does not belong to me, but only belongs to me when the Cayampas looked like silk, the color of a silver blue ocean. You tell us, this was the coup. These were years of silence, my childhood years. Tanks, soldiers snaked around the city, a machine of violence and sadness. There was no Chicago boys miracle. The blood in the river was blood. The hunger creeping through the city was hunger. The disappeared taken and black bands were taken. Their bodies, not just a story. This is the living I did not live. And later, I am hostage to the stories. The people who bled or screamed or ran, they are at the bottom of the Pacific, hidden in Coliseum walls, forgotten. Exiled fathers, sisters, lovers. I have not found them but as a song, a wailing tune, a funeral march, charred bone and dust, pulp eulogy, this spell of history, a dingy broken memory. No stanza breaks interrupt your conjuring. The poem is its own Coliseum wall. How does one ready themselves for writing about national upheaval, a country as dictator requisitioned corpse? Yeah, you know, it's, um, I did not know when I started this book that it would go in that direction, except that I knew that I couldn't avoid it. Um, and um, in the sense that I was born in 1973, the coup in Santiago happened in 1973. I remember being a kid under Pinochet, and yet I also know that I I lived a pretty good life. There was nothing for me as a, as a child, right, uh, protected by middle class and upper class sort of privilege, right, to know what's kind of going on. And in a way, it was only when I left that all of those memories became a juxtaposition with what I read when I was outside of the country as an adult, as a young person. Um, and so how I prepared for it was I wanted to try to make a thread to make sense between the feeling of nostalgia and loss that I experienced leaving Santiago at the age of seven, because it was a loss of language, of family, of, of security, and yet around all those memories is the structure of violence, right? The structures of dictatorship, the structures of, of power and suffering, and that kids my age had fathers and siblings and friends who were not lucky like me, whose parents were taken and just, and, you know, disappeared. Um, and so I, what I did was I am a, I'm a researcher. I'm a scholar. Um, so I spent a lot of time trying to access that sort of memory space for me. And then I read and read and read, and then I went to Chile and I spent two months, you know, walking through the commemorative spaces like Londres 30, 38 and Villa Grimaldi. And then I came back after and I watched, you know, 20 documentaries. And then I read first person accounts. Um, and I tried to just hold it all. And what I realized is nothing's gonna hold all of that. What poetry can do in some ways with the attention to the detail is kind of show us the limits of how to hold all of this, right? The detail in some ways is, is sort of 
it's not glue because there's nothing that's going to keep all these things together. Like I, when I went to these places, you wouldn't like, you wouldn't know that these were places. It's not like you go and it's like, Oh, these are places that horrible violence happened in. Right. When I went to some of these places, it was a beautiful day. It's a park. The sun was out. It was, you know, spring. <laughs> and so there's just this crazy, this amazing juxtaposition. And I think I immersed myself and tried to be honest about what memories are mine, what memories are collective, how collective memory and commemoration works in relation to individual memory and works in relation to forgetting, right? Because one of the things that commemoration does is also allow people to forget, mm. which is really interesting, right? When you commemorate something, then you can say, okay, I've built this monument, I've built this space, I've built this plaque, I made this plaque, and so now we can all say, this is what we agree on, and then we can forget about it. And that hasn't happened, I don't think, in, in Chile mm -hmm. yet. Interesting. The Agrimaldi is a list poem that testifies its first and second stanzas, tongue red gate, steel mouth opens to a speckled cement sidewalk, no blood now, no broken bits of teeth and buttons, the hanging tree in the middle, lotus flower shape, sky catcher, once upon a time a body rack, heavy sacks, swinging, legs, arms, gasps, part the wood. We end with lists of the missing, coarse crabgrass bursting out beyond the stone walls, the Andes, snow torches looming. During one of my workshops with the poet Jane Miller, she said something to the extent that when people write about place, they're really writing about time. How much of a lens does this provide for I Was a Bell? Yeah. Well, I think the anchor point there is memory. Memory is place and time, right? Kind of at the same time, right? And at the same time, what memory is, is actually story, right? memory is story right and and so i think for me one of the things that i wanted to think about is how precise can language be to capture the simultaneity of time and place when also you have to make it every time you have to reconstruct it right you you don't get to live in the in the fixedness so mm -hmm. I think this list poem, right, is um, this list poem took me a long time to write and I actually spent months researching it. And it's one of the smallest, shortest, and in, in, in some ways I would say a very quiet poem, right, in, in the collection as opposed to some of the longer and kind of, you know, kind of more sort of elastic, right, kind of big poems. Um, and I wanted that because in some ways, you know, if you don't know what Villa Grimaldi is, you can decide to look it up or not, right? It can become part of the architecture of your own memory building or not as you read the poem. Mm -hmm. um, it can become part of the space and time of how you approach text or not. But I wanted there to be um, like, they're very concrete images in this poem, right? The tree, the gate, the sidewalk, the buttons, right? These are all kind of tactile objects. While I think I was trying to capture the fact that there's almost an emptiness in this place because it's all been recreated. Like when the government, when the dictatorship ultimately was rejected with a plebiscite in 1989, um, right? These were places that were kind of, um, made in haste these places of transporting you know prisoners and and what were considered political dissidents and so they were actually you know like the Grimaldi was like a house it was like somebody's you know like place of residence and then it kind of became this other thing in the process of the government's 
sort of play decisions. Um, I think that tells me about time that that in Santiago in Chile, like there is a, a desire for time to be not what this was. Mm -hmm. And and then, of course, there's the Andes and the Andes, if nothing else, what the Andes are, it's geological evidence of time. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I liked that juxtaposition. I also think that when it comes to time and tempo, when you have these monosyllabics with mm -hmm. your images, tongue, red gate, yes. no blood now, legs, arms, gasps, part the wood. You cannot not look away from it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's a kind of way in which you want. I think this is a kind of form, the, the, the spondy, right? The sort of mm -hmm. heart, the spondy sort of rhythm, right? The staccato-ness, right? Um, also creates a rhythm, mm -hmm. right? That is anchored against this idea of time being infinite. Definitely. Could you read your poem before intersectionality? Sure. Then discuss how you would write a sequel, which might be titled During Intersectionality. <laughs> okay. I'm always giving assignments during these. <laughs> yes, I see that. Um, you know, this, so it's interesting. This, this poem is one of the earlier poems in the collection. And I have actually wanted to, um, to revise it. So I am going to take your prompt. I'm going to think about how I could sort of do this. Um, before intersectionality. After school, you hid in the bathroom, examining the day's insults stuck to your face. You punched lockers. You slammed bedroom doors. I tried books. I tried invisibility. We lived our sadness through each other. We lived our silence too. We straddled emptiness, Spanish in whispers, our parents' accents, their fears. South Carolina, 1986. We were lost between stories. What could we choose but silence? Mm -hmm. And so my assignment is what I might do with during intersectionality. <laughs> so, so, um, you know, it would be weird to write a poem during intersectionality because the, you know, this concept is one that suggests that there's no way to disentangle, right, the multiplicity of identities and that, you know, if one is a woman, and disabled, right? One experiences, let's say, sexism differently because one is disabled and a woman, right? Um, so during intersectionality would almost be like trying to come up with primal ways in which memory is happening in the present tense instead of in the past tense, if that makes sense, right? So here, right, the, the verb tenses are all in the past tense. I wonder if it would, be a poem that tries to think about um, the eternal ver the eternal present tense mm -hmm. in some ways, right? And and um, I actually think it would be very expansive. Like mm -hmm. I think I would have to spread. I, I mean, this is just I'm off the cuff here. You're you know, but I think that in some ways I would want it to almost look like I'm trying to make a map mm -hmm. with the idea of during right because in the during part is when you are trying to pinpoint the boundaries mm. and i wonder if that could be a way um i think the form would have to be very much the function of during so you would invoke cartography and then yeah. you would get some maybe get some theoretical physicists to, to, I know, to yeah. <laughs> it over you know yes yeah, I mean, I also, you know, I wonder if what I might do is I might do found work too. Like, I, it would be interesting to interview people about what they think intersectionality is and use their phrases because that is the during intersectionality kind of 
in the moment sort of practice. Like that could be another, I think you would, I think I would have to think about it, making it be almost more collective. Mm -hmm. That would be maybe another way to sort of do it. This is giving me good ideas, actually. <laughs> We're all about ideas and teaching resources. That's, that's yeah. part of One Week Critique's mission. Yeah, no, that would be really, I, you know, that, I'm teaching, I, you know, I teach in WGSS all the time, and I try to kind of have students think about these concepts in an embodied way. This could be really interesting. Hmm. I am hands down secretary <laughs> and treasurer of the Fear of Flying Club. No joke. <laughs> It's probably, it's probably my next little ID form that I'll carry with me. <laughs> if you sit next to me on a plane, you're elevated to chief engineer whom I barrage with questions about air travel normalcy. Yep. This is why I enjoyed your poem, Flight, whose stanzas interweave thoughts on work, family, and years wasted in worry with the standard safety announcements we hear before takeoff. The narrator has a case of personal reflection in the lines, envy, guilt, regret, muses of dirt and sadness shackled you to small cement wonders, suspended 35,000 feet above your life. What did this poem and the incorporation of found text clarify for you in terms of writing about self-evaluation? Yeah, I like, you know, your question made think a lot about, you know, this idea of self evaluation, um, right, because it's, it's sort of connotes judgment, right. Um, and, and, and sort of, it, it's not, it's, it, it could be generous, but it's also kind of critique, right, or sort of analysis of self. Um, what I can say about this is because I feel like I am the president of the fear of flying kind of club, right? <laughs> I am not just the treasurer or anything, right? I, and so I think this, it, it, what those found texts made me think about self-critique is that those words for me, because of fear, even though the speaker in this text, I don't necessarily identify that autobiographically with the individual moments, um, um, our our text it, it, um those found texts are how i evaluate myself which is to say found texts are what become the language we talk about ourselves with mm -hmm. does that make sense mm -hmm. so there's this wonderful um set of um uh studies that my co-collaborator um sort of um alerted me to that we often when we're listening to other people's stories or text from other places, however we encounter them, we actually end up plagiarizing those texts and they become integrated into our memory landscape. And so we sometimes think then that they're ours, that, that, that we kind of made them. And for me, this, this found text, you know, um, this is the seatbelt, right? You know, the lighting will do this, right? To me, that is me. Like I am in fact that text because of the visceral nature of mm -hmm. how that set of instructions organizes my affect in those particular moments of flight. Mm -hmm. It's routine, it's ritual, right? I have to listen to all of it. I also like, I don't know if this has happened to you, John, but I spend a lot of time researching the planes I'm gonna be on so I that don't. I can, oh yeah no no I'm an obsessive person like I have researched them I've read like um ask the pilot right there's like a whole there's been a sequence of that right and and I know what the I I know what the different dings mean right like oh that's the ding for we've reached 10,000 feet and then I wait for the pilot to sort of say we've reached 10,000 feet right um but what it means to what what this found text and found text means is that we're cannibalistic they become our voice mm -hmm. and and then in self-evaluation they become a way for at least it becomes a way for me to interrogate how those pieces of found text can also animate a different aspect of my writing voice nice 
I like how you're talking the way that, okay, found text is helping you with writing and with the overall tear of being, you know, 35,000, yes. 40,000 yes. feet. Yeah. I just go to my little image making self brain. And so I didn't fly for about 13 years from 2000 to 2013, oh. but then I was going to Arizona. So there came a time where I needed to get a place before. Oh, right. Right. And my way of just thinking myself into a calmer situation the word airbus okay so maybe it goes to the ah. fact that i've got this fascination with compound words and portmanteaus so yeah, i just kept saying okay. airbus you know the bus will get a little bit turbulent the, when you hit yeah. the potholes on the ground you're going to have okay. some shaking yeah but at the same time i'm sitting here chanting airbus 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 <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I have a I have a whole ritual of, for flying mm -hmm. like that begins well before I get on the plane. And again, a lot of it is found text. So I'm an agnostic, but I say the rosary in a particular way under a particular circuit. Right. So and that's another piece of found text. Right. It becomes how we get how we narrate ourselves in that space of time that and i get the earliest flights and the latest flights. yes oh my gosh <laughs> right why do you do that because in the middle of the day the air is most less i would right the air is most expansive so mm -hmm. the chances for pockets of turbulence within the clouds because right the, the heat and the cold are conflict com, combustible right in the sky mm -hmm. in the middle of the day whereas compressed air at the beginning or the end of the day means there's less turbulence mm -hmm. And I was once coming back from a poetry festival and one of the featured poets obviously was getting a better seat, so had earlier boarding. <laughs> and the poet said, I'll see you on the other side. And that's something you never want to hear before you get onto a plane. <laughs> no, no. You're just like, please, right? You can't assume anything. You mm -hmm. just have to hope, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Oh. In the poison time, there is love, talks about cancer, stage two with lymph node positive engagement. A section speaks to how chemo kills cells flowering inside. The liver rages against the fruit punch colored cocktails. The works juxtapositions pit treatment against torture memorials in Santiago one of them a headquarters of the secret police known as Londres 38. Another lie. I sat on the second floor staring at white, gray, faded walls. How did no one hear the screams? And then we have black and white pictures, cover rose garden, murals, sidewalks, Handwritten signs line the grass. Donde están? Donde están? Donde están? The question of every survivor. A third component of the poem. I was loved. Skin, hands, heart. Beloved. In the chemo room, my hands were warmed. My legs covered with soft, cotton blankets. In the cancer room, I was fed. There were no hoods. I call this writing of remedy, remembrance, and abundance. Do you have any recommendations of other poets whose work reaches a similar configuration? I mean, recommendations, I think that's a big ask, right? Because everyone's process is so idiosyncratic. I think for me, what resonated was the word cancer. So I was diagnosed in the middle of writing this book. And in fact, that was one of the sort of drives I had to sort of, I think the book shifted a little bit in its focus. I think the, the threading of the cancer poems right kind of came became part of this idea of what the body remembers and memory so it made sense to link them to these other poems um 
but so when I would do my research or, or even, you know, listen to interviews or, or watch documentaries, right. One of the, um, metaphors that were used, um, to talk about, you know, the leftist dissidents or the, the Marxists or again, it was, they're a cancer, right. They're a cancer on our society. Um, and, and. And so, you know, Eran Gan said, right, like that's, and, and we use that metaphor a lot, right, for things that we want to extract, right, from the, from the, from the health of the body. Um, and one way that I tried to think about the metaphors of cancer um, was cancer, so cancer cells, they don't know they're evil or, you know, they don't know that they're bad, right? They want to live just like regular cells want to live and everyone's cancer is really their own it's like yes there's you know types but like the more and more that oncologists and other researchers have done um sort of ex experiments and and research they realize that everyone's sort of um biology kind of dictates their own cancer so it's unique i guess is what i'm saying everyone's cancer is actually very unique and so I just kept thinking about this juxtaposition of kind of cancer cells want to live. And when I had cancer, it was horrible, but it was not a time of violence in this as, as like, yes, I want to extract this from my body, but it also is my body. Is kind of how I felt about it. Um, and then this, this kind of like consistent, like metaphor of like, this belief system is a cancer, right? On, on neoliberal capitalism, or something, right? Um, so I, I want. It, so what I would recommend is: is there is there a word that can be multivalent? Is there a concept that creates strange juxtapositions as you tease it out in the form of the poem or in its stanzas? Um, are there different ways of narrating how time affects the use of, you know, this concept or these words? Um, I think that's how I would start. For me, it was it was a very kind of like um, cliched trope, right? This is a cancer against. And then I thought, well, what does it mean to be a cancer? Hmm. And how does that work differently? when cancer, at least biologically, is about cells wanting life, which is a weird way to think about cancer. It's not like I'm pro having cancerous cells. But mm -hmm. the other thing, of course, is we all actually have that potential. Like that's one of the things that when I was diagnosed and did some research, um, cancer cells are actually in our body. It's the lymph nodes that prevent them from being more than they are. Mm -hmm. So the potential, I guess, is what I would say. Where is there the potential mm -hmm. for surprise? Mm -hmm. oh, well, thank you for that. And in the spirit of why this interview series was founded and with the assistance of some shared screen Zoom magic, <laughs> which I will do now, okay. could you please read an early draft and the final version of your poem a burning sure. and sure. it's is it going to appear somewhere soon i i heard yeah so this a burning is at least currently uh in my second collection congratulations uh, thank you and and i hope it will appear very close to to this um that i've signed a contract with redhead press so i'm hoping that you know in the next year and a half we that will emerge Great. um Okay, so I'm going to read the like very first longest sort of wildish draft and then I'll, you know, you can sort of see the other drafts that I that I sent you, John, and, mm -hmm. and then, you know, a burning, right, you can at least see the radical difference in sort of space. Um, so the original title was Radiation Tattoos. The first, a symbol of math, approximation, equivocation small dark the space between two parts neither being equal 
both sides the, the almost of truth. I wanted uncertainty to mark me, little pain, the taint of ink on the left side of my back. The second, mostly memory, waking I tasted chalk on the bow, its residue on strings, heard the low murmur, a cello, bass clef, no image, just thought, I needed more. Next to the math symbol, it is curly curved lines. Neither seem mine, dream marks. The last are dots, four horsemen, new constellations, one on each side below the armpits, one between each breast, one below. Charcoal seeds that cannot sprout, compass for machines with rotating metal arms, anchor for red blinking graphs along the breast, the armpit. On a slab naked from the waist up, I am scars, hair, sweat. Four technicians, daily doses, 10 minutes, six weeks. A world of invisible burning light. I forgot these mounds of tissue and fat are part of living. Soft like rice paper, delicate, warm, mine. Mine for my own making, my own wanting. I forget I am not meat. Mm -hmm. And so then the first draft, or the final, I don't know. We'll see. Um, a burning. Four technicians, 30 doses, 10 minutes, six weeks. A world of burning on a slab, naked from the waist up. Scars, sweat. I forget I am not meat. There so, was some revision going on there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, am I supposed to talk about the revision or? Sure. Oh, okay. Um, well, I just, you know, it kind of this is going to sound very boring, but I was like, what is the actual point of this poem? Like, what am I actually, what is the thing that animates or anchors me in this poem? that I'm trying to capture. And I realized it wasn't the tattoos, it was the radiation. Mm -hmm. And so then I thought, yeah, radiation as a burning, an invisible burning, a sort of thing that you don't think is happening because it seems like very mechanistic and sort of uh, almost um, sterile when it's actually happening, but it's very embodied. So I think I wanted to, and you know, I wanted the poem to also match the experience, which is on the one hand, expansive and huge, but also the moment itself is, in terms of time, not that much time. Mm -hmm. The most fulfilling act of revision for me is when I start with one of those monster sized, maybe two page poems, and then it goes down to a third of a page. <laughs> yeah, yep. no, and I am not a poet. You know, I have short poems in this collection and in my second collection. I tend to not be a small, I'm, I'm not a small poet, poem, you know, poem poet, but I, I, mm, Richard Blanco in one of the lectures I, I went to hear of his a couple of years ago, he said, you know, you need the poems in between the big poems to let people breathe. And I thought, yeah, I get that, but it doesn't mean it can't pack a punch. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to sort of do both things at once mm -hmm. <laughs> in this poem. Well, what I remember about driving through Oklahoma in 2013 to begin a new life in Arizona are the fish and chips style baskets into which you toss toll money. Maybe they're not there anymore. It's been a while. I remember that. Yeah. Huh. Oklahoma impressions are core to I was a bell. There's the admission in immigrant confession. I have ached for my Oklahoma childhood, my territory story. When the land gave again, held a promise of country after migration. 
Next, we visit this stanza from Immigration Office, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 1985. We were a sign of something still buried but pulsing outward from Oklahoma to Texas to other borders, legal, illegal, the things that happened in between. Finally, the immigrant children in alien magic wrestle with holiday quandaries. Santa Claus was as real as anything on my lunch tray. There were too many variables not to believe. It always began in December on the bus. North Pole utopias take a back seat to this excerpt from the poem's second half. We were gangly and strange, living in the flat lands of the Oklahoma panhandle surrounded by oil pumps, steer, and cowboys. Most of us were there for a few years as fathers worked in labs, in classrooms. Some of us were exiled. Some of us had visas. Some of us had no papers at all. Some of us would never return to the places we dreamed about at night. In what other ways was Oklahoma an early poetry teacher? Yeah. Um. What a great question. Um, I think Oklahoma was an early poetry teacher for me because it made me aware of sound in English. Um, when I was a kid and learning English, I learned English with a whole bunch of international other kids in what was called ESL, right? English is a second language. Um, and so, Oklahoma, strangely, even though, right, you realize later, maybe, maybe I was just a very naive child, that Oklahoma is like in the middle of a country in a very kind of, you know, conservative part of the world, right, in the United States in many, many ways. But I lived in married student housing. And so the Englishes that were available to me in terms of sound were a myriad of Englishes, right, accents, vocabularies. Um, integration of sort of like someone's original language with English, right? Um, and also English was a unifying language. So our neighbors were Iranian, South Korean, Ethiopian. And so English actually was the way of communication. And I think that's what I think poetry is. And so Oklahoma kind of gave me a way into English that was um, diverse and made learning English feel almost utopian. And I know that does not jive, that does not connect, right? There's no, like, if you think about Oklahoma right now, right? If you think about English, right? Um, it also made me think about accents when I moved from Oklahoma and Oklahoman sort of English pronunciation. That is a very different kind of pronunciation than South Carolina. And that's the next place we lived. And so talk about how sound becomes sort of once again animated in your knowledge of English. And in and so it made it, it Oklahoma made language alien, but in a way also that means is that you have to learn how to make it yours. Which is, I think, what poetry can do for us. It can make language ours. And I think all poets are trying to do that, make the language ours, but not just for us, but for the possibility of connection. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Oklahoma, as strange as it is, and all the ways in which I learned how to be an American <laughs> are what Oklahoma also taught me how to be, right? And then mm -hmm. you spend the rest of your life on doing it. Interesting. I've, I've only been once when I drove through. and Yeah. I mean, I've only, you know, uh, we were only there. I only lived in Oklahoma for four years, but for, it was very important years. Um, in fact, and here's the other way that Oklahoma was a good poetry teacher. 
I learned how to speak English before I learned how to read it. And so I came, became very aware of, you know, how words sound mm -hmm. before they appear on the page. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes it, it's. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think there are some poems where you talk about how there was no Spanish spoken in the house yes. or in very low voices. That's right. Yes. You know, there was a lot of, um, yeah, there was a lot of a desire to sort of assimilate in, into English, at least in my, in my family. Um, I, you know, I, I understand the logic, right? It's 1980 was not a moment in an American educational context where multiculturalism or even, you know, kind of multiple linguistic modes were sort of at least perfunctorily sort of valued, right? To to sort of be there meant you learned English and you took ESL and you learned how to speak and and you sort of that's what it means to become part of the community, right? Mm -hmm. That's very different now. Yeah. I think. I hope. Well, I would love to hear you read your poem Rooted. Okay, yes, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> Mind you. Yeah, yay! Uh, okay, uh, Rooted <clears throat> for Natalia. When I held her a decade and some ago, she was a world of blood, a flight sack with wide eyes and a hungry mouth, small succubus, demanding, angry, yet beloved, so beloved, my mother, my father, my sister, we traveled three time zones to hold her, to see her, this new alien creature made from old world stories, plane rides, suffering, and luck. She was our first, the first girl, the first to be grown from here, not a weed or a stolen vine, not planted from elsewhere, but rooted here in this soil. She was not piecemealed or half made. This land of misery and promises would claim her. She was of it. We held our wonder, imagined the land that would hold us all now to her. No need for paper documents of our naturalized tongues no more aching for ground and memory she would be the new world we all saw our bright planet in her small blue eyes curly hair we did not want to see any accents or sadness she would be the door she would be the gate she would be the hole to our brokenness this is how the muting continues we contort, we twist ourselves, we aspire to quiet plate spaces in between cracks. Now she looks for her face in the black and white pictures in my mother's shoe boxes. What am I? Who am I? She demands. She rages against the emptiness of bootstraps and hidden shames. Oh, we try to tell her something of our deep, deep past and sorrow, what the Pacific smells like, the way to hold her tongue to roll an R, how to eat cebolla y tomate, how to claim more than this dirt. But we are ghosts. We have given up the flesh. We are like ghouls after the war. And she has no patience for quiet immigrants. Wow. What was your criteria for choosing this as the collection's closing piece? Yeah, I thought about this question because it's a, a lot of different readers end up asking me about it. And I think I wanted it to be the ending of this book and the opening up of something new. Um, and I also, you know, thinking about who the audience for this book might be, you know, on the one hand, you want many people to read your book and find connection to it. But I also had a very clear sense that I wanted the, the 
the sort of next generation of, of my family to sort of have a touchstone. And so I chose Rooted because it's not that the book isn't rooted, it's rooted in memory. And at the same time, I wanted the idea of rooted to mean that it could be rooted in something else. And that's why I chose it. And I chose it because it, I think it's a bookend and it simultaneously works as a promise. I like that. It's given me a lot to think about in terms of just why we place certain value on contenders for the ends of our books. And then we narrow it down yeah. and down and down. And, and this book is fall of 2021 and you're still, you're right. traveling, you're literally traveling the country for it. You were in Tucson, I think maybe two weeks yeah. ago at the festival of books. Yeah. And was. yeah. Yeah. It's really, yeah. You know, I, it's interesting. Um, my relationship to this book is I feel like I'm good where this book is and I'm ready for for the next sort of step in my evolution as a as a writer. And I think that poem, right? She has no patience for quiet immigrants. I'm also ready to put this part of the memory down and think about other memories. And I think that's what I wanted this ending to be about right mm -hmm. you know the speak the the this is a book i mean this is a poem inspired by right my niece um but also of course not right um and i liked the idea that there was the possibility that quietness isn't really going to be what the next thing is going to be that's a good sentence <laughs> yeah but yeah. Thank you for your time and insights. Oh, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I am so grateful for everything that you have uh, um, facilitated for this book. And I am excited. You know, I have your book on my nightstand. It's uh, very exciting. Um, and I know that um, I appreciate and I'm so grateful for your generosity, John. Oh, you're so welcome, Soledad. It is, it's yeah. been nine years. And I'm happy every time I read about a new poem or that you publish or an award that you receive. And I just have a final question sure. about your accomplishments as a co-recipient of a national endowment for the Humanities Connections Grant, in addition to a Great Lakes Colleges Association Expanding Collaborations Initiative Grant. It seems these days as a creative writer or someone is part of one we critique, we are constantly in grant seeking mode. And yes. <laughs> but what and I'm sure there are other grant seekers out there who will be watching this. What did these projects consist of? And what words of wisdom do you offer where grant applications are concerned? Yeah. Um, I think I'll answer the second one first. Um, because it's it's a it's a been a, a process of of learning. I think that what grant seekers, what I have learned is, you have you want to be ready for the grant, if that makes sense, right? You want to know where you are in the process of your project, so that then you can really have a grounding for narrating why this is the opportune moment for the grant. I think that in a lot of ways, right, um, grant givers want to know that they are um, going to maximize their investment. It's a terrible way to sort of, right, but they want to know, right, this is an opportune moment for this recipient or for this group or for this poet or for this writer or artist um, because it's going to do the final push or it's going to get them through the next big sort of part of the the, of the thinking and the and the creating mm -hmm. um and i think you also want to be in my experience um collaboration is really important in grant seeking right um collaborate with people make connections um none of us you know there is a fallacy that poetry is an isolating or isolated thing and it's not right poetry is connection 
right? Poetry is collaboration. And so I think if you can ground your grant seeking in that way too, that may be actually um, a way to find unexpected um, connections with grants. In terms of what they were, right? It was actually the NEH grant was a wonderful grant. I co-wrote it with my research partner um, and it was about um, interdisciplinary team teaching and bridging the gap between the sciences and the arts and the humanities mm -hmm. so that so that kind of modes of creation were thought to be sort of more convergent than divergent right so it's mm -hmm. kind of like that so that was the that was the impulse that was the impetus and then that that was the same for the great lakes college association grant we actually funded 10 teams of faculty across four different institutions to team teach a class many of them in the sciences and in the arts and humanities so that students could see right that um, the ways in which disciplines that seem very far apart from each other are actually are rooted in creation and creativity and questions and um, see, you know finding ways to make connections nice i like how you talk about that opportune moment it made me think of all these years of teaching composition when we get to the kairos lesson day <laughs> that is the opportune moment yeah yeah so you have to kind of you have to feel confident enough to know it's time or or be self-aware enough to know yeah i'm not ready for this grant yet right i'm mm -hmm. not i'm not in a position where i could really devote myself to crafting an artist statement or a statement of purpose that is really kind of ready Good to know. I I did fundraising before the poetry life, and I remember in the aughts, and it's it always feels so weird saying that phrase. But in the <laughs> aughts, they would send us to fundraising seminars, and oh. they always emphasized linkage, interest, and ability. So the L I A triangle, and now oh, okay. it's the rhetorical triangle. So I just go from one triangular learning system to the next. It seems like with each decade. Yeah. But I, yeah. it taught me how to get over being shy about asking for money. Absolutely. Ask your work is, that, that is the other thing, I think. And I think different co communities and populations, you know, have different relationships to feeling confident enough to ask for money. Um, I actually wish there were more demystification of this kind of thing, right, in the poetry world, because I think, um, to demystify means, I think, that it creates more access, mm -hmm. more right accessibility. Um, I, I wish that funding streams were not so um, sort of, you know, uniform in a lot of ways, right? That there would be more funding for all kinds of different mm -hmm. ways of entering the world of poetry or the world of writing. Mm -hmm. And there was a very brief phase where I would do pro bono fundraising, I'll be your fundraising helper work. And I have this PowerPoint from 2010. Oh, wow. And when my computer knowledge is, I know enough to use the fundraising software and PowerPoint is a fairly new for me at that time. But I thought it was the coolest thing I've ever done was finding <laughs> a graphic of someone diving into a pool of money. <laughs> yes. Replace all that chlorine. And, and therein lies the metaphor. You're diving into this gold bullion, the sea yeah. of riches and wealth and opportunity to get your ideas and your passions funded. Yeah, and most things aren't funded. So that doesn't mean anything about your work. That's the other thing. It's like, just like most things aren't published, doesn't mean anything about, you know, your value or your ability to succeed next time. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much again. You, I've enjoyed John. our time together. A Zoom reunion. Yes. And thank you for your I'm book. I've read it now at least four times and oh it's God. it's made it it's made me and just from today's conversation now I think about the ending of a collection differently. Oh, I think about you. time and history and place differently because I there are a lot of those Arizona years that I want to write about and those Mississippi years going from the southwest yeah. to the deep south and Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, what a 
those would have so much texture. Those, that kind of writing was, is about the texture of those experiences. The Cactus and the Magnolia, not a book title. <laughs> <laughs> but exactly. that's, that's where I'm at in my process. That sounds great. Yeah. Well, I wish you all the awesome Thanks. luck. In... Yes, and you too. And I look forward to a, a more, a, a sooner timeline for a reunion than, than nine years. <laughs> Definitely. Well, great. thank you again, Soledad. And I hope you have just a great final semester wrap up in the next few weeks. I guess you got what yes, a you month too. and a half. Yeah. We've got six weeks. Yep. That's where we are. Yeah. You too and okay. enjoy the summer and um I'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay.